Aloha and welcome back to The Creative Life from the American Creativity Association on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Phyllis Bleas, and our co-host today is Darlene Boyd. Today on the show, we will be discussing how to use your noodle with our guest, Seattle Soba Master, Chef Soma Matsuko. And she has been the food and wine winner of uh, for Best New Chefs in 2019. And that has to do around the opening of her restaurant in Seattle that specializes in handmade soba noodles called Kamanegi. And she also has a sister establishment next door where she serves sake, and she's a sake sommelier, and that's called Haniotu. And I'm sure I didn't get that right, but I think Chef Soma will help us with that. Today, we'll learn her approach to creative thinking in the food industry and in restaurants, and why she won a major contest called Use Your Noodle, for which she made ramen noodles and new recipes and won a $50,000 award. Uh, you can send your questions to Chef Soma and the show today through email at questions at thinktechhawaii.com. So, Chef Soma, arigato for joining us today. You can get a lot of English and Hawaiian, but arigato, aloha for joining us. And can you just explain a little bit about what soba noodles are and what makes your restaurant different and creative. So, soba noodle is basically made from buckwheat. Our recipe is 80% buckwheat, 20% wheat, and about 50% of water. That's it. No salt, no no egg, any, anything else. And our restaurant, every soba noodles, I make myself by scratch. That means mixing by hand, rolling by hand, cutting by hand, which takes lots, lots, lots of time. I think that's uh, one of the reasons our restaurant is popular. It's like everything from scratch, everything handmade and love. And not only soba noodle, we focusing on unique appetizer, like you never seen anywhere else. Um, example, our most popular appetizer, it's called foie gras tofu. It's a tofu dish but not made from soybean. It's made from foie gras, but tastes like tofu. Mm -hmm. Well, we're gonna see you chopping noodles here in just a minute. Uh, and yeah, so you said this buckwheat noodles, mm -hmm. fresh, you make them every day, fresh that day for the cuisine. And how many restaurants in the United States can anyone go to and get fresh buckwheat noodles? Soba noodles. In US, I yeah. think one in San Francisco, uh -huh. one in Texas, Austin, and one, no, three in New York. I think that's it. Okay. So, so for folks watching the show, you have to get to Seattle and taste this daily fresh handmade soba noodles made out of buckwheat. And tell us a little bit what got you into the business of making soda noodles. Is it a business or is it kind of a love of life for you? So when I was a child, I was growing up eating my grandmother's noodles. She makes like, uh, when family gather, she makes like soba noodles from scratch, makes us a tempura, like all sorts of feast. And after I moved to United States, I never seen handmade soba noodles. And dry noodle, soba noodle is like completely different things. So, um, I moved back to Japan once and study how to make soba noodles and practice. And I come back initially just, just for myself so I can eat it. Then I realized, oh, no one else is doing like, why don't I start business? That's, a, that's how I started Kamonegi 2017. So we do talk and we're going to show at some point in the show, the audience is going to be able to see you chopping your fresh noodles. And there are YouTubes that we want to tell everybody about that we didn't get the copyright to that shows her in her kitchen 
do, uh, create, putting the flour and water, water together by hand and she's kneading it, she's rolling out the dough and she's chopping it. It really is a labor of love. And it's, so first of all, from a creativity and innovation standpoint, when there are no buckwheat fresh soba noodles in the United States, you kind of followed the path of necessity being the mother of creation. So you made your own and you're making them for everyone here in the US. And I think that's that's one of the sparks and inspiration for being creative. Um, and I and in the making of it, is this a, um, it, didn't you say that it's a very changing art that every day with temperature and conditions, you're having to change your recipes and what goes into it on a day-to-day -day basis because of weather? Mm -hmm. So it's not like changing recipe, more small adjustment. Like rainy day, like moisture level is up. So I have to add touchless noodles, uh, sorry, touchless water. Mm -hmm. Or cold day, a dough gets tough. So you get more water, like need more. Like uh, atmosphere is not always the same. So dough react every day difference. I have yeah. to touch the small difference to make adjustment. It, it just sounds luscious. And Darlene, I know you have questions and we're gonna shift to those that you have and uh, tell the audience more about your creative style. So, uh, so in the last few days and, and since we've met you, I've been haunted trying to think of someone uh, that I had heard that it's been said that creativity is one of the most important skills for a chef. And I, I knew that, that I was somewhere and someone had said that, and it just came to me recently that it was Edward de Bono and it was after a meeting and perhaps he was just trying to get a better dinner, but uh, he was telling us that all the strengths of chefs and that in his opinion, in his professional opinion, that chefs might be the most creative people that uh, will ever, ever cross our paths. So that being said, you, you, our guests come to us in many different ways, but you came to us through the press where we noted that you won a contest mm -hmm. and the Use Your Noodle contest, which you won. Can you share with us your, the soba making process that you used in, in that contest and uh, perhaps the recipes that, that you entered? Yeah, so technically, this is completely opposite things. Like uh, I make soba noodle, basically same process. It's like a, a origami, like, you know, you, you have to hold certain way, certain, certain way to make crane, right? This right. contest is completely opposite. Like you like destroy everything, then um, you make from scratch by using a component of ramen. Does that make sense? Yes. <laughs> so th this particular contest is is it similar to what we see on television in those cooking contests or did you have to go somewhere or did they come to your place this was from uh instagram so we just like uh, tag them mm -hmm. okay all right so so there was there's a creative productive thinking skill that we wanted to share with the audience today and it comes from many directions, but one of the books on creative thinking, this is a series of books by Dr. Joyce Juntun. And uh, it's a fun book and she brings to our attention five different creativity skills to make you more productive in your creativity. And one of them is fluency. Uh, another is flexibility. Another is originality and elaboration and evaluation. And I know you have a special way that you won this contest on using your noodle. And you, the way we would describe it in the creativity world is you use fluency. And fluency means, this is by Dr. Joyce Gentoon, uh, it's thinking of many, many, many 
many ideas. Some people would call it brainstorming, idea generation. And I know you have many uh, ways that you worked with your ramen noodles. Did, was it 50 and you did it over a month? And let's have the engineer show us some of the many ways that you created new recipes to win the contest. So talk to us about that. Can you uh, enlarge the image? That'll have to be Sage. Oh, Sage, can you make it bigger? So like one, you see the bottom. I made a uh, tonkatsu using noodle as a crust instead of panko. Uh, uh -huh. Top one is chamushi using like a, a powder as a broth and made a uh, egg steam custard. And ice cream sandwich. So I dip in the chocolate. Sandwich with ice cream, that's so good. Um, other one is pizza. I made so many. <laughs> so brainstorming is just inside of your head, right? So I try to make actually things happen. So like I can taste it, I can feel. It's next step of brainstorming, but it's kind of brainstorming. If I make 50 different things, I can choose like top three. Okay, this is amazing. That's like how I create, like make a lot, then choose top things. When you said you tested, were you the only tester or did you have others on your staff taste and test or and clients taste and test or just you? Uh, this was during pandemic. So me and my staff, like we tasted as well, like, you know, lunch. <laughs> So now this, so what, what I was hearing you tell us the other day is you tried 50 different recipes over a month mm -hmm. of something new, and then you choose three and those three make it onto your menu out of the 50. Have there been other foods or um, types of cuisine that you did this process? I thought you said something about oysters and were there other examples where you, you, you do this regularly in your process of Cooking. Yeah, I did it once with oyster, like 50 different way to cook oyster, but I did it with uh, sake pairing. So like sake, I select sake paired with that new oyster dish. Um, other things I did was hot sandwich maker challenge. Have you ever seen hot, hot sandwich maker? Like when you use for like camping? Uh -huh. Okay. Uh -huh. So I cook similar to a panini grill or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I didn't cook sandwich inside of hot sandwich maker, but I cook something else, like 50 different way, like scotch egg or like sushi, uh, okonomiyaki, gyoza. gyoza, yeah, lots of different things. All right. Well, I think this is this. Uh, Dr. Gentoon also wrote another book. I didn't. I don't have it with me, but it's called Creativity: Thinking with Foods. And maybe we'll have you know we'll have another show with that. But this, what we really wanted to let the audience know is, I mean, it's very creative and fun to hear just about the food and the restaurant. And we also want to know what those skills are that we can all go and access ourselves to be more creative and I think that you're doing you have a very big demand on your day I mean you probably work almost six or seven days a week long hours you're the owner and the, the chef isn't that right mm -hmm. so this is keeping you very much on your feet but also as you're doing so you're not creating a routine where you do the same thing every day you're doing many the, the same thing in many different ways, it sounds like every day. And it's, what are you thinking, Darlene? It just sounds so innovative. It, it truly does. Um, and, and also related to, to the innovation is, you shared with us that you have a motto uh, that, you that you remind yourself. Can you share with us that motto? Yes. And, and why okay, you uh, don't think and just do it. I just if you have to experiment, try. It's just, oh. you know, you cannot brainstorming, like you have to make product. Yeah. And 
Yeah. Which, which explains to us why chefs might be viewed as, as some of the most creative people, because it seems to me with 50 recipes to put in there and 50 ways to play around, that it can't be just playing around because you could have quick failures on the spot. So there's a, a whole list of knowledge base, strong knowledge base and skills, I would assume, would you not? You mentioned that you had gone to Japan to study first before you went through this process. Yeah. You also told us a story about your grandmother. So the roots of your studying and playing around go pretty far back, are deep rooted, aren't they? Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. Well, you remind me, Darlene, I wanted to, if we had time today to talk a little bit about your expertise with sake. And I don't know if everybody realizes there are sake sommeliers and you get the same kind of cert, go through the same kind of certification processes uh, that we do for wine and spirits. And I, I, you're, you just keep pushing the doors wider open to more creative ways to show up with your food each day and in your restaurant. So tell us what it means, first of all, to be a sake sommelier and what sake means in Japan, coming from a very Buddhist Zen background. How, did, how does that get brought into the culture in Japan? So uh, my sake bar called Hanyato mean wisdom water. So Hanyato is Buddhist word for wisdom water. So like back then, monk thinks like if you drink wisdom water, make you think more, make you smart. <laughs> so I want people to drink sake to, you know, you think better and be smarter and be more creative. I love that wisdom water. So what is that? And it does that would Sake doesn't mean that, right? What, how would you say wisdom water in Japanese? Hanyato. Oh, that's the name of the restaurant. All yeah. right, all right. I knew we'd get a real clear phonetics and also understanding. Hanyato mm -hmm. is wisdom water mm -hmm. in Japanese, and then you're serving sake for that. So there must be many different ways to, I know I'm in a wine tasting and investment club. Oh, wow. and we had sake twice was the what we what we did our wine tasting and I was so surprised to learn that some of the most expensive sakes were served cold and growing and growing up sort of in Hawaii and spending many years there I only got it served hot in little hot sake dishes so could you tell us a little bit about the cold sake versus hot and the, you know how to add these to your meal or to your week? So some people think hot sake is bad or cheap sake or like more happier <laughs> drink, but that's not true. Um, sake is only beverage you can enjoy besides tea. You can drink cold to hot. And there's yeah. so many different types of sake. Some sake better showcase cold, such a daiginjo type. Like daiginjo, like more high end, like more fruit forward, like clear sake. But uh, like kimoto style sake, more old style sake, tastes better warm or hot, tastes more umami. So it depends on like what you like or what's your preference. They're both correct way to drink sake. So, Soma, are you part of a community of chefs? And if so, do you, do you all gather in your sake bar and gain your wisdom? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do, you have, do, you, do you have other chefs that you can regularly discuss and bounce ideas? Back yeah. And huh? Interesting. And um, well, I, I, I wish we could do a sake tasting here and, and have you take us through the delights and the variances of the different tastes. Um, do you pair your sake with different ch chosen soba noodle dishes or are they, does it go with anything or the other dishes that you make from scratch at the restaurant? Most of the dish goes well with sake. Mm -hmm. And also I have different type of sake at restaurant and more here. You know, like some people think fish doesn't taste great with red wine. 
prey, right. but fish or like any seafood, it's amazing with sake. Like example, people like eat sushi with sake, right? Just because sake doesn't have any iron, so it doesn't like fight like iron and fish. So I think any 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 sake you choose from our bar or restaurant tend to go well with everything. Oh, fascinating. Mm. Well, you know, one of the things I just got noticed from the engineers, I think that I would like the audience to see you doing this homemade soba noodle buckwheat noodle making and there will be a silence when we're showing it but i think that would be absolutely appropriate to have a sacred silence as we watch you doing the handmade noodle making so max if you would uh, bring it on we'll know that it'll be a silent few minutes watching this ancient art of soba noodle making thank you Just a cutting part. I know that I wanted the longer um, video. Oh, and we don't even see you, but it still is something for viewers to see. Yes, yes. Oh, a little bit of you. Awesome. Well, there we are, and we got a little bit of Chef Soma in the in the video, and it's it just been a delight to learn more about your creative processes. Darlene, do you have anything? Yeah. So the, what, what do you think, or, or what, what efforts do you go through to make your customers come back? Um, I like changing menu often. That's like number one, right? Like if people like my food, like I make sure I post it on Instagram so people see it, people come so, back. So you do use social media. All yes. right. And technology. Okay, a little bit of that. You're not <laughs> your broad based knowledge there. <laughs> uh, how did you find out about the contest? It was on Instagram. Was it posted on Instagram? Yeah. So you found it through your following on, mm -hmm. on Instagram. Interesting. And how long did it take you to prepare for the contest? So I made one things a day. So like about a month, but I do like one thing a day and difference. And and so over the course of a month, did you turn in these recipes to the contest uh, producers like throughout the month? You kept sending new recipes in or did you do it all at once? I just post it on Instagram every day. And oh, I see. You posted it. Mm -hmm. I see. So it's an entirely electronic process. Mm -hmm. I see. And do you hold fairs or food days in, in anywhere around Seattle where you show up with a food truck and try recipes out? Or is it they're always coming in just to the restaurant? Just to the restaurant. Okay. Mm -hmm. So as an art, you were talking about your daughter mm -hmm. and that you were hoping that she would learn this art of soba noodle making. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about that. Why is that? What would, how does that add, would that add to her life and maybe our lives to, to, to do this kind of practice and art in food? It's, uh, you know, family things like my grandma was always cooking for, you know, grandkids and go generation by generation. And when my grandma died, it's same day my daughter was born. So like, I felt like something like I should teach her soba noodle too. So, you know, hopefully when she became mom or she became grand grandmother, she can teach grandkids or kids how to make soba uh, or at least like feed them soba. Uh, thank, you. thank you so much. That was really touching and reminds us too that staying in that, in this area of, creativity and being innovative and and getting away from cookie cutter kind of life and and sharing the special unique uh gifts that we give when we're using our own creativity each time it's so different and it, it you made it seem very special in our american creativity world of creativity your touch of it 
Um, I would agree. There's something beautiful in the discussion, Phyllis, especially as you describe it. And, and I think we often talk about the stages of creativity, if, if one ties into that there are such, and, and so many you talked about brainstorming. But, but I think there's something more beautiful underlying here. And it's, it's not just using the tools, but there's an ebb and a flow, Soma, that you describe. And, and I think you would agree, Phyllis, as, as we're listening to this process, it's not just step one, step two, step three. There's the pulling back, and then there's the beautiful flow, and then we turn in and we add the wisdom water. And uh, so it's, it's, <laughs> it's really a pleasure to listen to your dedication. Thank you. It certainly is. And I'm going to have to close and talk about the next show. Is there anything that you wanted to say, Chef Soma, uh, before we close the show out, besides inviting people to the restaurants and coming to Seattle? Yeah, come to come and eat, come eat and come drink with the water. <laughs> <laughs> That's beautiful. And well, on that note, Thank you, Darlene. We will leave it here for today. Dear audience, you have been watching The Creative Life on Think Tech Hawaii. And today, Darlene Boyd and I have been discussing how to, quote, use your noodle to develop creative thinking skills, such as fluency in your daily life. We've been with Soba Master Chef, Soma Mutsuko. And she wants us to remember, don't think, just do, experiment and try. So thank you very much for participating. And I'm Phyllis Bleach, your host. And in two weeks, we will be back with another edition of The Creative Life. Aloha. Mm -hmm.